You're back. Good. What can I help you with? Dirty metal door guards the southwest entrance to the apartment building. It's locked. The door rattles against your knuckles, but there's no response. The door rattles again, but this time you hear an elderly woman's voice calling out from inside. Stop banging on the door. I'm not letting any more strangers inside. <laughs> the police. Everyone knows the police don't come round here. No, I already told you, I won't be responsible for any more strangers getting into the building. Go check the backyard door. Maybe someone there will. Madame, I assure you, we are real police officers. There is no reply. Just faint sweeping sounds inside. The door rattles again, but this time, you hear an elf. Stop banging on the door. I'm not letting any more strangers inside. Doesn't matter who I am. Now go on, get out of here. Ha! <laughs> the police. Everyone knows the police don't come. No. I already told you. Go check the backyard door. The streets will flow red once more. A great torrent rushing down Rue de Esperance. You wait and see. The streets will not flow red with anything. Who are you? I'm Cindy the fucking Skull. What else do you want to know? Date of birth, blood type, the last time I was tested for hep C. Away, pig man, but I don't promise to answer. I ain't no snitch, pigstein. Go forth and forage in someone else's shit. No shortage of squealers in these parts. Actually, there is a shortage of people who talk to us in a normal, calm, informative manner. We weren't put on this earth to make your life pleasant, fucko. The lieutenant is desperately searching for another handkerchief. Hatred? Disgust? It's difficult to tell which of the two is more present in her girlish features. The woman on the boat does not notice her staring. That was on her. Someone's got to keep an eye on her. On a first-name basis with her, are we? Piggy's moving up in the world. Have you got a crush on her? Aching for an opportunity to defend her honor. Can't you tell? I'm painting a beautiful mural. An aereo graffitio visible from low orbit. I haven't really started it yet. I'm waiting for the right words.
This place is severely lacking in havoc. Not even the occasional trash can fire to break up the tedium. I thought I'd mix it up, you know, summon the forces of crime and social chaos with a wall. Have you ever tried your hand at graffiti -o? When faced with a blank wall, most people write unimaginative stuff like pigs go home and Mono is here. We rarely see pigs round here though. Just union cats. And my name's not Mona, so. She wants it to be something true and total. Yeah? Thanks. I'm sure the inspiration will come to me now that I have an official RCM stamp of approval. You've lessened her desire to deface the building. Watch your back, Ungular. You've got eyes on you. What's that noise down there? You see a young man on a balcony, nursing a cigarette. His eyes have been following you for a while. Not looking for any trouble, officer. I don't want to be seen talking to the gendarmerie, if that's okay. I just want to finish my cigarette. It's the god of cigarettes and youth. Ask him if he's got anything to spare. Apologies, but this is my last one. The god himself has denied you absolution. Absolution? I don't know that brand, but I'm pretty sure you can get Astra's at the Frit. I'm not sure that's a good idea. As you wish. Is it really that important? Like a nervous cat, he keeps stealing looks at the neighboring windows. All right, but make it quick. Once I finish this cigarette, I have to run. By God. This young man has the body of a decathlete. His lithe form was practically made for vaulting over the high bar. My name? My name is Martin Martinez. Martin Martinez? Good local name. Let's go with that. Occasionally. Why? No, I just like to look good. He gives you a honeyed smile before shaking off the cigarette ash. I'd even go so far as to say that the view is a little too good, my dear gendarme. Do you have an estimate of when the body will be taken away? We will remove the body as soon as possible. Now tell us, where were you last Sunday? Oh. You already asked me that, didn't you? No, not you. Some more muscular type. And when did you speak to this more muscular gentleman? Last week? I don't know. Look. You didn't answer the question. What were you doing last Sunday? <sighs> I had a friend over. It was my Sunday friend. A Sunday friend? How intriguing. Makes sense. 
Friends are nice on Sunday. You don't have to work. You can just spend time with pals, watching rugby and drinking beer. He doesn't reply, gesturing no with his cigarette. Under the gray sky, snow continues to pile on the neighboring window sills. Someone hides behind a curtain. Those windows have eyes, and those eyes are watching, spying on you three. No. We won't. Now, if you'll excuse me, I really need to get going. Time to bring out your secret charm. Tears and beg him. Show him your emotional side. Throw yourself before his very feet like a dog. No, for God's sake, I don't want you to cry. Listen, I really have to go. Good luck with the investigation. He's gone. No point in running. Tenements like these often have multiple exits. If he doesn't want to talk to us, then he'll know how to hide himself. He could be a witness. Him or his Sunday friend. Either way, we need to look into that muscular type who's asking about our case. There has to be a way of getting inside the building. Let's go check out the door near the pier again. Once we found a way in, we can ask around for his apartment. Sturdy metal door guards that this could be a way into the apartment building the smoking man of that. Good. We had enough problems with bums and drunks and thieves loitering in the hallway. You have no business here. You're well versed in the kind of threatening legalese that implies criminal liability, but in fact has no meaning whatsoever. Miss, would it help if we offer to show you our badges? Hold your horses. <coughs> I don't care about your stinking badge. Just come in. Give me a moment. The cold never does any good for my bronchitis. <laughs> this woman's health is failing her. There's not much to do. Not in this damp. Go ahead then. What do you want to know, policeman? I'm no one. Just an old woman who cleans these hallways. If you can call it living. I have a little room upstairs right next to the coal room. It's barely bigger than a closet. But I don't complain, no. I have my bed and my aching bones to keep me company. And that's all I need from this world. And all she gets, too. The coastal wind beats down hard on the coal room door, outside. Splashes of waves make the balcony slippery. Oh, you'll find plenty of Martins here. Don't you worry.
pea brain. Someone played a trick on you. Martin Martinez is a name for anyone who comes from Martinez, like Jim Jamrock or Raoul Ravagel. Oops, you really didn't get the joke there. I thought it was obvious. Anyway, officer, we don't have the witness's name. Yes, yes, I know who you mean. The scrawny boy who's always smoking like the devil, right? Somewhere in the building, a child starts crying. You hear a radio tuned to a talk show and someone taking a shower. What's he in trouble for? Talk? <laughs> he lives upstairs in room 28. Go to the balcony. It's one of those doors there. He's usually home in the evening. Thank you. We should go check out his apartment on the balcony. See if he's home. Ask away, policeman. The artiste? Nothing I can do about her, I'm afraid. She ruins the walls faster than I can clean them. Still, she leaves an old lady to her business. More than I can say for others. She mumbles some kind of a response, then hacks something into her handkerchief. <laughs> A shift in temperature, the air chills around you. Dust settles on the stony floor. have learned how to saunter up staircases. I didn't think you could do that with hooves, but here you are. Yeah, I can see that. Cool mutations. That smell coming from her paint bucket. It's not paint, it's heavy fuel oil. Red dyed heavy fuel oil intended for exclusive use in government vehicles, to be precise. What did he think I was using? Aquarelles? Sucked it out of a cop's fuel tank myself. Back in Jamrock. She really did it. She's proud of it too. You ain't seen nothing yet, piggy boo.
You hear someone walking around inside, rearranging the furniture. The number on the panel says 10. The walking stops abruptly, but no one comes to the door. You can feel tension on the other side. A poor communard from the looks of it. The room is barely bigger than a closet. Do I have to open the door? Do you have a warrant? I'm not obligated to open the door if you don't have a warrant. Let's go. We don't have a reason to get inside that apartment. Later then, entering this door seems a physical challenge. This door has been closed with a padlock. A chalk drawn number on the board says number 11. It's a solid lump of metal, but the shackle is deeply corroded. A solid pair of chain cutters would make short work of it. Better whip out those cutters. You won't get very far otherwise. No reply. This door is made of metal and appears to be reinforced. Someone here really values their security. Number 28. This is where the cleaning lady said the smoker on the balcony lives. Let's see if anyone's home. Knock on the door. No one answers. Looks like the young man we are looking for isn't home. I think our best chance to catch him is in the evening. We should return tomorrow after we have finished with our day's work. How about 9 p.m.? Sound good? The smoker on the balcony. This is why we are here, right? He might know something about the murder. Suddenly, he's a little worried about your memory. Tomorrow, 9 p.m., right here. Apartment number 28. Good, let's go. Damn. Turns out it's quite tricky finding someone in a big apartment building. 
Don't worry. You'll get him. Remember, tomorrow, he's probably gone for today. If you want her attention, you may need to be more forceful. Where am I? Who are you? The smile on her face has disappeared, replaced by the wary aspect of a cornered beast. Well, never mind. I remember now. I'm still stuck in that traffic jam in the 50s. The men have the small jewels and everything is made out of plastic. Why do you need plastic when you can make the world out of amber? Back in Mezca, during the time of the revolution, the side walls and cafes are filled with the young people. I was on my way to see a new Boyadero picture starring Gabriel Buendero. Until you came along, that is. Someone was. This is Gabriel Buenguerro. A strikingly handsome man looks straight at you. His head crowned with a wide brim hat. His hair is dark as an oil slick, and his jaw the most perfectly chiseled thing you've ever seen. This man's got a hold over her, even 50 years later. You can feel it. He was the biggest star of his day. Girls used to faint in the aisles of cinema whenever he came on the screen. And schoolboys used to memorize all his lines. They are someone's memories, boy. What difference does it make if it's me or not? They are beautiful. That is all that matters. Beautiful and true. And they will win. You're coming for this, you know? All of this. She seems to derive some bitter pleasure from this strange thought, as if the past will one day wipe the present away, like a tidal wave approaching. I wasn't dreaming. I was there, Loman. It was early spring, and the man behind the black sun had just come out. The posters were 20 meters tall. Everything was golden. While you, people, were tearing each other apart over your petty little revolution, in Mesk, it was a golden age. Why not, Harife? It's not like I have anything better to do in this hellhole. There's something off about this woman. Tell her to show you the soles of her boots. Maybe she was at the hanging, somehow. 
diamonds? Of course not. But wouldn't it be marvelous if I was? Whatever stupid things they put in the lorry, I imagine. I quit concerning myself with that a long time ago. Besides, I don't drive the lorry for the cargo, if you know what I mean. She says that as if something narcotic is the real reason. Then it's contraband, Loman. What? Do you want to take an old woman in? Be my guest. Lock me away like bad hand, Hermenegildo. Of course not. To truly understand the Boyadero, you need to listen to On the Western Plain. It's an old ballad about a young girl who falls in love with a daring Boyadero. He promises to marry her as soon as he returns from the Western Plain. Of course not. The Boyadero returns from the Western Plain a changed man. One night, as he and his beloved are out walking along the river Maigret, she pleads with him to give up his riding and settle down. So the Boyadero strangles his beloved and throws her body in the Magret. Then he rides off, because the Western Plain is calling to him. You have to understand, a true Boyadero needs a whole horizon to himself. He can't be tied down by man or woman. His beloved was selfish. She didn't know what it meant to love a Boyadero. What if to truly love a Boyadero is to float lifeless downstream? She's just a distracted old woman. We should maybe let her get back to her things. So he doesn't think she's a smuggler? You hear that, low man? I don't think your partner likes you spending too much time with me. Oh, don't worry about me. I'm one of the best communers around. I drive routes no one else will. Lomonosov's land, Udajnaya Zemlya, the Western Plain. A terrible cold comes over her, rattling her teeth as she steers inward. The Transcatholia Magistral. You for one, eh? At the Stradas do mirror. All the good ones. The deep trenches. Where the bluebirds fly. Irmao. I already am dust. Now what do you want with an old woman's boot, Sheriff? Please? I think you should let me get back to Gabriel Buenguerro. You are not Gabriel. Gabriel doesn't say please. She's wearing sturdy worker's boots made of black leather. Buckles run across. The sole is also made of leather. Just before Gabriel, it was the coronation of Franco Negro. Now, there was a real man. I could have told you that from just looking at them. A size is 37. The feet of a little girl, they fit well on the pedals. What do I need drugs for, low man? What I see, what I feel, the great adversary, no drugs can compare. Yes, there is a protagonista and an adversary. I am on the side of the adversary. There's no coming back from that hole. Those epithets are familiar somehow. The great adversary, the great unrest. I don't like the sound of any of that. Sounds like a horrible drug. The worst one of them all. The woman sways her wrinkled shell back 
and forth, a strange grin across her face. Yes, go. Enough jamboree. I need to get back to Meski. the first line of defense. I am the last. In addition, these so-called hardy boys are an effeminate clique of bodybuilders. Their company is spiritually degrading. The hardy manlets are on the pay of the company. I answer to the union alone. And I do this out of race heroism. Finance is an alien concept to the Simonians. Now leave me be. I must luxuriate in the company of my woman. And... Look, Bay. The minion of law is also a racist, but his racism is basic and rote. He thinks he has solved the great race enigma by describing a rote mechanism of scientific competition. So unadvanced. The basic race education he received in high school has led him to think his phylum the sole authors of race theory. An esoteric study reaching back to the ancient mass society of Pericarnassus over 4,500 years ago. Basic racist, I take pity on you. You clearly want to enter the harbor bad, like a little boy who wants to go on the potty. I can press the button for you. It will open the door. Very well. You may enter the door once. Our race conversation here has concluded. Finally. Let's go. Let me 
missing. Race pupil return. There is nothing funky. I cannot possibly. On second glance, someone has forgotten to properly close one of the drawers. It's unfortunate for the Union to just leave their paperwork lying around like this. Let's see what's inside, he thinks. The drawer opens smoothly. Inside is a well-organized selection of brown folders. Hundreds of documents containing logistical data. Two kinds of transactions stand out. Materials coming into Revachol from the outside world, from Muindi, Grad, and even Ilmara. And the same materials being handed over to companies inside Revachol, Kuron, Coal City, La Delta, and Jamrock are listed among the many districts where the imports are being sold. It's hard to make sense of this thicket of company names, dates, quantities, and percentages. You try to focus, but the lines are getting blurry. Whatever's hidden here is hidden well. Concentration isn't enough. Only a trained accountant with a background in logistics would be able to really make sense of it. However, there is a little handwritten note stuck on the side of the drawer. It appears to be a to-do list written in large, uneven capital letters. Remember, Leo, Everard's shoes Special whirling borscht, water Everard's plants, sweet office floor, more banners. All items on the list have been crossed out and the note itself is crumpled. Everard Clare, probably, the head of the Debarders Union. One of his aides must have left it. Nothing incriminating here. What is so special about this borscht? Code for drugs, booze, blood. Remember, Leo, Everard's shoes, special whirling borscht. All items on the list, the drawer slides shut smoothly. The front of this quarterly journal features a large satirical portrait of the late King Frieser. From the sides of his head, a pair of white antlers spread to the corners of the cover. Because white antlers are one of the symbols of communism, they represent a society in accord with the natural world and at the same time above it. A shameful way to treat a former king, even one as underwhelming as Frisell. Because Friesel was incompetent, foolish, and cruel. In short, the embodiment of everything the communards wished to overthrow. It's satire, you see. To your disappointment, there aren't any full-color pictures to direct your attention. Just column after column of closely set text, interrupted occasionally by little doodles in black and white. After rifling the pages with your thumb several times, you return to the table of contents. 
The magazine is divided into several sections. International Development, Kunst und Kultur, and Local Concerns. Just inside the cover, there's also an editor's note. Comrade, as you know, this journal takes its name from Mazov's immortal expression, Du Cristal a la Fume. This was his way of describing the way the rigid, crystalline structures of capitalist ideology turned to smoke under communism. But like the structures of capitalist ideology, we too are at risk of going a la fume. Unlike many publications which are content to spoon feed their readers reassuring drivel, la fume is committed to telling the radical truth, even when that truth may drive away potential subscribers. So please, if you value our radical Mazovian perspective on contemporary politics, culture, and international affairs, please consider subscribing today. Yours in struggle, the editors. What do you expect? It was laying around the office of the Debardeurs Union. They're probably bankrolling the thing. You flip back to the front of the magazine. The table of contents unfolds before you. This section includes a long, tedious critique of the latest round of free trade negotiations between the EPIS nations and the Free State of Seminine. You also skip over an article about heavy fuel oil smuggling along the Mesk Messina border, something about bear wrestling in Samara, book riots in Yugograd. Face it, you really aren't interested in foreign affairs. You're not even sure where most of these countries are. You flip back to the front of the magazine. It takes a moment, but gradually it dawns on you that Kunst und Kultur must mean arts and culture. As you leaf through this section, you come across several reviews of recent radio plays, as well as a brief artist spotlight featuring a local artist identified only as C.S. The main feature, though, is a long essay titled Tip Top Tourne, A Critical Mazovian Perspective. This so-called artist spotlight is really just a brief Q&A, made all the briefer by the subject's evident hostility to her interviewer. That certainly sounds like a certain delinquent youth who likes to harass you from her balcony. The actual article is surprisingly light on details. But after skimming a page or two, you gather that it has something to do with motor carriage racing. You think you're settling in for a relaxing recap of the most recent season, maybe sprinkled with some nice anecdotes about a few of the more colorful drivers. Instead, you find yourself skimming a 10,000 word feature about all the politically problematic aspects of Tip Top Tourney. Where to even start? For one, there's the crass commercialism of its sponsorships, and then there's the practically criminal emphasis on deadly motor crashes. Oddly enough, this article has two bylines, Nasteb and Kalada Bernal and Exilus Buka. Under capitalism, the article says, every pursuit has its price. Every pleasure, even one as elemental as the joy of racing others around a track, is reduced to an advertising opportunity. Thus, the so-called tourney becomes a competition between increasingly meaningless brand signifiers. Your discount laundry detergent racing against a pack of Astra cigarettes, or even a fritter. And that precisely is what's problematic about it. Were it not for the promise of random, spectacular violence, audiences would quickly lose interest. At the end of the day, it's the destruction of these 750,000 real races that you're really watching for. You see, one cannot avoid the conclusion that Tip Top Tourney is simply the apotheosis of spectacular entertainment under capitalism. I can safely say the thought had never crossed my mind, Detective.
I'm sure most things are, if the young men who wrote this article are to be believed. If I had to wager, I'd say they've never even seen the inside of a motor, much less a motor race. I take whatever they write with a large grain of salt. You flip back to the front of the magazine. The table, unsurprisingly, much of this section is taken up with articles declaring unqualified support for the dock workers' strike. You skim the headlines. Paint the harbour red and white. Martinez tames the wild pines. A city in revolt. First we take Martinez, then we take La Delta. Finally, there's a brief article by the writer G. Martin accusing the owner of the Capeside Apartments of illegally attempting to evict certain communist tenants simply for not having paid their rent. According to these editorials, there can be no accommodation with the forces of international capital or their mucilaginous allies in the coalition. Why do communists love puerile insults? And they wonder why they're always being left out in the cold. Judging from the context, it's something very large and fundamental. You should probably know about it already, honestly. You flip back to the front of the... An imposing combination of a punch clock and a payphone is looking down at you from the wall. A note on the side says, Tokens unavailable due to strike. Use change. The machine swallows your coin and seems to be waiting for your next move. It's unclear whether you actually have muscle memory. Right now, your finger is just drawing vaguely occult patterns in the air. Undoubtedly, no. Sure, nothing tricky about that. The tarpaulin cloak is still hanging on the railing. The white rectangle of the Revachol citizens' militia is clearly visible on its back. As your fingers touch the tarpaulin, it almost feels like the cloak wants to deliver a message of comfort through your fingertips. I will shield you from the elements and give my life for yours. That's what the cloak is relaying. You must. But please hurry, we are pretty easy to spot up here. Nothing incriminating catches your eye. 
The cabinets are clean and their sparse contents meticulously organized. There's a framed photograph on the table. It's a black and white photo of a young couple out in a street fair. The man, Rene, is dressed in a Royal Carabinet uniform. The girl is young and very pretty. She is smiling playfully at the camera. Rene looks like he's about to smile. This photo must be tied to some good memories. Why did you take that picture of Rene? You're really interested in that old soldier. Not sure I understand your fascination, but sure, as long as it doesn't take up a whole lot of time. seems to control the large crane above. A container is attached to its hook block. With a loud grind, the crane shifts overhead, moving a massive metal container through the air. Surprisingly quiet thunk, the crane places the container down. This crane was built with a purpose which has now been fulfilled to move this container. Who can say? All you know is it's special. I can't see how that was worth the records, except for seeing the crane in action, which I admit was satisfying. one of many in the yard. <sighs> Is this like your thing with that wall again? You do? Because I don't. There are a million containers here. Why are you fixating on this one? There may very well be, but we are not here to look for that. We are not here to interact with containers. We are here to get the body down from the tree. You attempt to turn the handle to no avail. The doors seem to be mechanically locked. To your left, the lieutenant considers your actions with some puzzlement. No reply.
container, container, I'll turn you nice and red. Container, container, put the logos on. Container, container, used to be Wild Pines. Container, container, now belongs to Everard. Everard, 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 he looks after everyone. Huh? Well, hey there, how can I help you, mister? The look in his deep blue eyes is as sincere as you've ever seen. Kind of makes you feel like an arsehole for no apparent reason. I see you are not a union man, mister. Did you get lost? You're not one of them scabs, are you? I mean, I don't personally mind. Folks is just folks, you know, and folks gotta eat. Just some of the other guys don't look too kindly on the scabbing kind, if you know what I mean, mister. Oh, I'm just making some covers for them containers here. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. So it's easier for the crane operators to spot them. Sure, mister. About what? Oh, most of the guys are down at the gates, keeping the scabs from coming in. We're on a strike. The whole union is. You don't have to work when you're on strike. Ha! We haven't worked for two months now. So no one is working? <laughs> Not everyone is down there, of course. Mr. Everard is in his office, where he always is. And Jean-Luc is guarding the gate. But Titus and his boys got into some drunken trouble and Everard sent them on a nice vacation for a week or so. Oh, I'm not really supposed to talk about that. That's union business. Him and his boy stirred up something in town. Probably drank too much and got into a fight or something. I heard Mr. Everett telling him to take some time off. Don't go all bad cop on this simple friendly fellow. I guess the boys got a bit too rowdy and had to let out some steam. I don't really know the details. Well, that's just how boys are, you know. <laughs> I haven't been in a fight since I was in middle school. Easy, Leo. Let's keep this on the hearties. Too late. Leo's mouth is still moving, and the words are spewing forth. Words, words, and look, even more words. This guy could go on till the end of days. Now he's talking about some drunk sawmill owner who... No, he already switched to a prized fishing rod he apparently owned at some point. You know what? Just cut in there with your questions. Yes, yes. Everybody needs a job, and this is mine. I'm Leonard, by the way. Leonard Bellick. But everyone calls me Leo. I'm like Mr. Everett's right-hand man when Mr. Edgar is out of town, and Mr. Edgar's right-hand man when Mr. Everett is away. <laughs> Actually, Miss Beaufort is the right-hand man, but she's a lady. <laughs> Who is this Miss Beaufort? A real pretty lady with a skin like those Douai Sucre candy bars my missus likes so much. Them are real nice to suckle on once the dinner is done and me and the missus sit down beside the radio. But I can't listen to the radio all the time. There's so much to do around here and I'm always busy keeping things running here. Yes I am, yes I am. Stay on this Miss Beaufort topic. Yes. This place really seems to run like clockwork. Keep it up, Leo. Well, thanks a lot. Coming from you, it means a lot, really. Sometimes I feel some of the guys don't really get how much I bust my ass for them here. But you guys are all right. The white rectangle on your clothes might not mean an awful lot in Martinez, but the recognition from an authority figure made Leo's day. Oh, yes, yes. I leave all kinds of notes for myself. That old head of mine ain't so good at keeping things in no more. I almost forgot about the borscht. 
Oh, yes. I've been taking special whirling borscht to the men every day since the strike started. <laughs> it's very, very good. Makes a man feel so warm and happy. I feel like I could take on Mr. Renadam's boar dogs every time the lunch is done. Power borscht, huh? Never heard of a borscht that turns little guys into dog fighters. Alcohol, however. Yes, yes. I'm taking it to them. The borscht keeps them happy and in fighting spirits. Makes you all warm inside. They brew it in the whirling in rags. Oh, sure, mister. Sure. You do that. Yes, sir. Oh, that one. That should be empty as far as I know. Lots of containers here have nothing in them. They're just waiting to be loaded up. Tell you. Oh, you want Mr. Everhart then? He's an awfully nice fellow, he is. Him and his brother are both nice fellows. They've lived their entire lives in this here neighborhood. Guys like Mr. Everhart and Mr. Edgar, his brother, are real good guys. Made Martinez what it is today. Mr. Ever and Mr. Edgar and I went to the same school we did when we were boys. Patience. Deep down you have the mental power to keep listening. Not many would, but you do. Had an arithmetics teacher, Miss Bellows. <laughs> Her real name was Miss Bellums. She was a real pretty lady, but when she got mad... <laughs> All the boys liked her if you know what I mean, mister. We used to sneak in her yard in the dark and peek through the window. One time we saw Miss Bellows with a fellow. Yes, we did. Yes, we did, mister. Them was naked, too. That's all I got to say about that. Thank you. Eh, almost forgot. Mr. Everard is in that container over there. I got distracted telling the story, but he's in there. Bye-bye now.